is ChaosCast, the Chaos Community Podcast, where we share use cases and experiences with measuring open source community health, elevating conversations about metrics, analytics, and software from the Community Health Analytics Open Source Software, or short Chaos Project, to wherever you like to listen. Welcome to this episode. This podcast is sponsored by our friends at Sustain, a community of open source enthusiasts and professionals that care about the future of open source. Learn more at sustainoss.org. So welcome everyone to this shared podcast between Sustain and Chaos. And we'll keep this really quick. We have six panelists today to talk about maintaining open source. And we want to do a quick update on a previous episode. We'll link to it in the show notes and talk about what has changed and what does maintaining open source look like today. So let's do a quick round of introductions and I'll start with Richard. Thank you, Georg. It's great to be here on a cross podcast for everyone on the chaos podcast. Hello for everyone on the same podcast. Hello, you know me. I'm Richard. I work at Open Source Collective, helping to manage the 3,000 plus projects there, which we fiscally host at Open Collective, which is pretty cool. I also work for Sustain, whatever that means, organization of people doing cool stuff about open source sustainability. And I also am writing a book on birds and I'm in Vermont and I'm wearing plaid because you're mandatorily have to. So yeah, that's me. Thank you, Georg. Don. Hello, everyone. I'm Don Foster. I am based just outside of London in the UK. I am director of open source community strategy at VMware. I'm also on the governing board and I'm a maintainer for chaos. I'm also involved in various boards and committees with the to do group open UK and others I'm probably forgetting. So thanks for having me on the podcast. And Willem, you can go next. Hello, everyone. This is where I'm, I'm from Beijing and now I'm work for Huawei and I'm also a, a, a member and I start the local community Beijing 2020. And it's very nice to talk with you guys. I spent a lot of time with the uh, chaos guys and I follow the, the sustain podcast and learn a lot of things. And it's my honor to, to be here. Oh, but Amanda. Sure, thanks. I am Amanda Kateri. I am in the, I work in the open source programs office at Google as a researcher and engineer. I also have the honor of being an external faculty at the Complex Systems Center for the University of Vermont. And I am a co-founder of Open Source Stories with Julia Perioli. I'm also working with a group called the Computational Democracy Project, which I very much enjoy and haven't had a chance to talk about here before. Normally, I am calling from Vermont, same geographic area as Richard. Today, I am calling from San Francisco. It's my first time back here since 2019, and it's very different. I'm very excited to be here with everyone today. I'm going to pop it over to Georg. My name is Georg Link. I'm a co-founder of the Chaos Project and governing board member. I work at Biturgia as the director of sales. So I get to spend a lot of time talking to a lot of amazing people about their work that they're doing. I Previously did research on open source and talked to a lot of maintainers from that perspective as well. So I'm super excited to do an update with you all today on what maintaining open source looks like today. Ben. Hello, I'm Ben. I'm executive director of Open Source Collective, a fiscal host that looks after about 3,200 open source projects. And I also maintain Octobox, which is an open source application for GitHub notifications and have a little part to play in 24 pull requests, which is a kind of give back to open source campaign that runs each December. Thank you, Ben. Obviously, Ben and I work at the same place some of the time, so we just have the same hat on. I don't know how geographically that works. It's just a very long hat stretches between here and Britain over the ocean. And it's weird, weird thing to say, Richard. Let's move on to other cool things. I would like to give a bit more context because I'm not sure that all of the people who are listening from the sustain side know what chaos is. So sustain is obviously a weird organization that doesn't really have an organization. It's a group of people who sort of met and were like, huh, what's going on? Where are people holding conversations around open source and like the long term implications of how we do open source together? 
And we've had a few conferences, San Francisco, London, Belgium, Belgium, well, Boston. And it's been really fun to sort of watch it grow. COVID obviously influenced the way that we do things. Two years ago, the podcast was able to talk about all the working groups that were going on with Sustain. Over time, a lot of those working groups have kind of been prey to non-meetup atrophy, where if you don't meet in person for a while, it kind of ends up sort of fizzling out. There are some working groups that are still ongoing, the open source design working group, for instance. But a lot of the people who are in Sustain at the moment and interacting with Sustain either do so through the podcast that we have or from showing up on our discourse or just being part of ad hoc meetings where we sort of say, hey, let's talk about foundations this week and, and so on. Chaos is kind of the opposite. Chaos seems to have this really amazing train from an outside perspective of just going up the mountain. You're all doing the stuff. You all meet all the time. I don't really understand how it works. I know that Chaos is partially funded, which is great. And I know that you regularly have workshops attached to larger conferences where people come and work together on all the cool things that happen to make Chaos work. Now, Georg or Don or Willem, whoever wants to take this question, I want to know whether my perspective is accurate and I want to know what chaos stands for and I want to know what you think you do there. Sure. Happy to take that question, Richard. And you praise us, make it seem like we have this super awesome, amazing community, which I like to think we do. So, <laughs> yes, it is quite amazing. I did not think chaos would be what it is today when we started five years ago. And we started from the realization that we need to understand how our communities are doing. With Sustain, we had this sense that, hey, we need to have these conversations about how to make open source more sustainable and better. And in Chaos, we had the drive to, okay, let's put some numbers behind how we are doing right now. How are the communities doing? Everyone was looking at number of commits and how many authors do we have on the project and so on. And this conversation really showed that there is no standard for looking at the health of an open source community. And so we started Chaos to bring those conversations together. And Chaos stands for Community Health Analytics Open Source Software. That's the acronym, C-H-A-O-S-S. -S. So we have different work streams that are going on. One of the things when you talk about active meetings, we have weekly meetings just for the whole community. And then the different working groups have their own meetings. And the working groups are focused on defining what are the metrics that we can look at in and around open source and writing it out. We give each metric a name so we can standardize around. We are now talking about code contributions or we are now talking about issues. Then we define why do we even look at a metric? What does it tell us about a community? And how do we go about collecting the data? And for that, we also have software projects that go and implement these metrics and where you can go and you have open source software that you can point at an open source project. And within the effort of setting it up, now you can see how is the community doing? What's the project doing? That's how we started. There's a lot more going on now. We have expanded the community to different parts of the world. Willem is a really great example because he is sitting in Asia, talking with us, joining the meetings. It has brought from a maintaining the Chaos Pro Project some challenges around how do we do translations, how do we work with different time zones, how do we bring together different languages. We have an active community in Africa. We have another work stream around badging. So for the diversity, equity, and inclusion related metrics, we face the challenge of how do people actually start using and implementing the metrics. And so we came up with a badging process where events and projects can work with us on looking at what they're doing and looking at the metrics, and then they can show a badge as a way of saying, hey, we've thought about these things and you're doing something in this area. Now, there's probably a lot more going on that I'm not talking about. That's the high level view. And maybe Willem or Don would like to add 
what the Chaos Project is doing these days. One thing I did want to add is that, as Richard mentioned, we do tend to get together in person as well. So we have a Chaos Con coming up on the Monday before the Open Source Summit in Dublin. So we used to do these at a regular cadence twice a year. With the conferences moving around, we've struggled a bit to get them. So I think we're not quite at twice a year right now, but we used to do it with Open Source Summit North America and then FOSDEM in Europe. But we do have one coming up soon. And I think those events are a really good way for us to kind of keep the momentum going. But I think the other thing that helps us keep the momentum with the Chaos Project and keep things moving is that we have twice yearly metrics releases. And so the different working groups, we're on kind of a deadline to get some metrics out every release because you don't want to be the working group that didn't do any metrics for this release that didn't get anything done. So I think that there's a little bit of self-imposed pressure that's helped us keep things going throughout the pandemic when things have been hard. I'll also say as someone who is frequently oversubscribed on projects and things that I'm doing during the pandemic, especially, it was really hard to sign up for anything new or to sign up for like large, ambiguous projects that either had no end or had anything specific. But there were a few times that I remember I got to like, I had it in my note, like if you need something to do that will energize you, go to chaos. And there were a few issues that It was really easy to just kind of walk in, have a short piece of a conversation in a respectful way to give experience or ideas. And then that was it. It wasn't a big, like, I think the structure of chaos really is open to large scale collaboration and discussion in time for creating something tangible. And at a time when so many things are ambiguous and large and complex and layered, it does feel nice to have those, you know, moments where you can be like, oh, I, I helped with the thing at least one. Even if I can't do all the things, I can't attend the working groups, I can't do all of it. It is lovely, I think, for contributors to be able to have that like, oh, but I helped once with this one thing. And then it's a release. And I think that discrete piece is really nice and satisfying. So I would like to thank you all for that. I like the phrase, the structure of chaos. Just have to say that because it's quite funny. We always like to joke that we are chaos to bring some sense into this chaos of open source. That's true. That's true. That seems a bit overblown, but I like it. I like it anyway. One of the things I'm thinking about is how chaos does allow that structure and how sustain doesn't. And what's interesting about sustain is that we tend to be a community of people who are high level ecosystem pundits, basically policymakers, people who are in OSPOs. There's a lot of people, like the one major exception to this is the entirety of OSCA, which is the best. So like Open Source Africa has their own sustained thing every year. And all these maintainers can meet together and talk about all these things that are really important, like burnout or docs or onboarding. But in sustain itself, I feel like those needs are being met in other places already. And what's happening is that like sustain tends to be a conversation that's much more about, well, what does it mean to actually talk about? about, say, federal input into the open source ecosystem. What does it mean when we talk about the function of OSPOs within European, like, industrial complexes? And it's very different conversation than, okay, I'll show up, I'm going to comment on some issues, and then go home a bit. And I often wonder whether that's a lack. It's something where we're not meeting the people who could be joining Sustain, or whether it's just a feature of the kind of people we have and what's going on there. My question for chaos is can you tell me a bit about the kind of community members you have where they're mostly coming from are they mostly maintainers are they mostly people working in ospos are they mostly industry i think we have a pretty good mix of people i feel like chaos has i would say kind of two core groups of people that tend to contribute so we also have a lot of academics So people who are doing loads of data and analytics and in the context of their work at universities and writing papers who also then contribute to chaos as well. And then we also, I mean, I do have a PhD, so a little bit on the academic side, but mostly industry. So I work in an open source program office. And then there are loads of people who work in open source program offices, big companies, but we also get a lot of intern interest. So Google Summer of Code, Outreachy, people who are just passionate and want to contribute to a cool open source project because I feel like chaos is a pretty welcoming community. I don't know, Willem, if you have a different perspective coming from Asia, maybe you could talk a little bit about the community that we have there. 
Yeah, from my perspective, I heard about the chaos because I'm a mentor in the open source community and there's a bunch of new projects coming and I need to know develop the status. And I heard about uh, chaos and I also introduced this to my colleagues. And in Huawei, we like do some management when we consume the open source project. And it looked like we need to know the status of the open source project. And we learned a lot from chaos community and by participating in the bi-weekly meeting. And we also have some connections with some university students uh, and they're quite interesting about learning some things from the community. And uh, from my perspective, I spent a lot of time in a RRC a Software Foundation. It's the, like the more technical community or the people I touched or the programmers. They may not care much about the community status like the OSPO guys, but we talk about the numbers, especially about the GitHub stars, the commits, and if there's a new guys coming. And these interactions could give us a lot of feedback to help us to do some adjustments. And I think this is quite important if we want to run the project for a very long time. So I really appreciate my experience with Chaos Guys and I really learned a lot of from this community. And oh, by the way, this community is very open and very welcome and help us a lot. Some of my colleagues may not speak English, but we still get a lot of chance to talk with those guys and learn a lot of things. So I was just going to say at the risk of sounding defensive. For me, sustaining chaos have always been different in one kind of key respect. Like chaos, I feel like has got more of a central kind of purpose in that everyone is working broadly on the same kinds of goals. It's kind of about trying to understand open source and trying to kind of measure it and be able to almost empirically kind of guide towards a kind of healthier, better, however you want to refer to it, kind of open source. Whereas Sustain has always been about hosting those kinds of conversations and creating spaces, right? So the reason why we had the podcast was because that's space for us to have these kinds of conversations. The reason why we have the events was again, you know, to bring people into a single space to share what they've been working on. And it's what they work on between those events that's important. And it's maybe a failing that we sometimes don't have the strongest kind of connections back to people that are doing that work. But I think we all kind of come together and have a sense of community around. We care about this problem of sustaining open source software. And yeah, like I think we have our own kind of takes on how we want to push that forward. So for example, as a result of the work just before we started Sustain, kind of started a project and received some funding from Ford and Sloan. And just in the last six months, we've been pushing forward for a piece of infrastructure that we want to create, which is called Ecosystems, which is a result of the conversations that started at Sustain. So I think, yeah, like that's for me, like the key difference and also maybe a, a bit of a likeness as well. But yeah, I just wanted to kind of say that. Yeah. And just to but, add to that, I mean, if you're talking about sustainability of open source projects, that's a much broader concern than just metrics. And I absolutely think that's true. I mean, I, I went to one of the Sustain events in the one in Brussels and next to Potsdam. And the conversations were all over the board. You had people talking about how to grow your maintainership community, how to get funding for your projects, how to do the work within an open source community. And so I agree, like it's a little bit easier for us in chaos because we have a very kind of narrow remit, like we're trying to measure the health of open source projects. I also want to resonate that the sustain community and creating the spaces, as you put it, is just really great uh, way of starting conversations and then getting the people together who, when they start talking about the problem and start thinking about solutions, things start to be created and we have seen things come out of it. One of the questions since we have been here from Open Collective is around the question of sustaining open source and maintainerships. I know one of the problems maintainers have said for a really long time is around funding. And when they work on open source, it's not necessarily as part of their work. Sometimes it's outside of their work or they've did something for their work and then their job has moved on. They've changed companies, but now they're still stuck maintaining the same software, not getting paid for it. Or maybe that has changed a little bit in recent years. I 
just wanted to, to ask if there is an update on the funding situation in open source and if anything has changed there. That is a very big question. I will say that yes, things have changed, but they've also stayed the same, which sounds as confusing as it is. So for Open Source Collective, the landscape that we're operating in now is very different from when we started. So when we started, we were talking about thousands or maybe if we were lucky, hundreds of thousands. And right now we accept something in the region of a million dollars a month on behalf of our three and a bit thousand projects, which is huge. But there is a huge discrepancy still at the heart of that distribution. So while there are a few projects that have become financially sustainable, there are very many others that are nowhere near that. And we have kind of two problems. Right? We have a problem of trying to kind of distribute the opportunity to support projects, which is a problem both on the side of the projects themselves and trying to make them amenable to someone coming in and saying, hey, like, I depend on this project and I really would like to see the kind of progress that you're representing here. And also on the side of the funder, they're just simply trying to understand what they use and what they can support. So yeah, like things have stayed the same for many and things have changed for us and changed for a few of our projects. And we kind of ended up in the situation where we've got two problems. We've got to try to like broaden this opportunity that exists for a small subset of projects which is in part why we're building software like ecosystems as infrastructure to help people understand what software they depend upon and help projects understand who their audience are effectively. And also dealing with this problem that we are holding a lot of money on behalf of our projects. And maybe we need to organize to be able to support open source in the more kind of general sense. So we're looking at doing things like encouraging collectives that maybe have enough money to contribute to an open source security fund centrally for other projects in that community to kind of self-identify and say, hey, yeah, we would like some help in that area rather than waiting until they've got enough money to fund someone full or part-time on that project. So yeah, lots going on. It's a very big question. Those are some key points right now. While open source software today is powering critical infrastructure, the open source ecosystem as a whole is rapidly changing, facing challenges for governance, maintenance, maintainer burnout, funding, marketing, and more. Are you concerned about these things for your open source software too? Well, in the sustained community, we discuss these challenges and share solutions for how to sustain open source in the long haul. We meet once per year in person, and the rest of the time we keep the fire burning in our discourse forum. Join our conversations at sustainoss.org and sustain OSS on Twitter. I'm super curious, and I think this applies towards chaos and sustain, that one of the key points I picked up on that you were talking about, Ben, was the concept of holding resources and holding resources across many projects or a single project. And it sounds like the idea of paying into a larger collective fund is around the idea of like skill sets and understanding like how to, right? Because no, no person is an island and you can be, but if your project or expectation of the maturity of your project is at a high level serving a lot of people and becomes critical infrastructure for many people and they're paying you for it, that's a lot for one person or a small group of people to carry. And it's a lot to ask for, I think, in terms of skill set. So I'm curious, and I think Richard, you and I have talked about this as well. And I'm curious for the chaos group. You know, when we think about maintaining maintainers, sustaining who is a maintainer and the skill sets they bring and bringing across kind of like maturity of skill set. I wish Errol was here because they have such lovely things around the open design community. But I'm curious from this group, like when we're thinking about resources, who gets paid, how money flows, how we identify when help is needed and how people can rate their hands and buy into groups or find folks. So not only health of communities, but like health of communities that are sustaining other folks within there. I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that, on how that's changed in the last few years as well as money is flowing and people are saying that they need more help to do things. I think that's something that we've seen a lot of concerns around maintainership and sustaining maintainers. So I'm also co-chair of the CNCF Contributor Strategy Technical Advisory Group. And then these are discussions that we have a lot around even some of the big CNCF projects like Kubernetes is in a situation where it is it's extremely well-funded. Loads of employers contribute people to work on the project. 
And yet there just aren't enough maintainers to do all of the work. And it's become a problem for a lot of projects. And it's one that really doesn't have a straightforward solution. And it's something that a lot of us spend a lot of time talking about, but we don't have any real clear solutions for it. I think it's kind of a funny question coming from you, Amanda, because you work at the complex systems lab. And it's just like, these are complex problems. And it's really hard to put your finger on how things are changing and what's going on. I don't have an answer. I just wanted to point that out. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I don't think I'm looking for answer. Discourse is fine. Discourse of like, yeah, this is a hard problem. A few years ago, however many, there was a large like, oh, well, let's just get people paid. And now it's a, well, well, some people are getting paid. Some people are getting paid. But is everybody getting paid? Is the people who need to get paid? Are the people who can afford to do volunteer work getting paid, but the people who can't afford to do volunteer work getting paid? Like, I think it's, I think it's a larger question of not just distributing money to, if we're talking about the complex systems perspective, right? There's the identified notes and then there's the shadow network. So what is the shadow network that is sustaining open source that is not identified? And I say shadow network, definitely not from the like, but the people whose name is not necessarily present on an author's list, but it doesn't mean they're not doing work or contributing or doing things or it's needed to do things. I like that a lot, Amanda. What it reminds me of is actually what has changed over the past two years. I mean, I remember five years ago, I built a business around telling people to like have a contributing.md file. That wouldn't make sense today. It's just over. Like everyone knows it's a thing you should do or they decided intentionally not to do it for various reasons. It's just like putting a license in your repo. I think it's much more common than it used to be. What's more common in the past two years that I've seen from my particularly weird angle on open source is a lot more people talking about getting documentation into open source projects, a lot more people talking about getting designers into open source projects and acknowledging that that's actually some sort of weird sort of work and a lot more people talking about, okay, let's get GoFundMe up type thing, but not GoFundMe anymore. It's just like, cool, let's get Open Collective up or let's get GitHub sponsors up. And so people are getting paid a bit more. What's different is we're just starting to see in the last year or two a lot more moves from not just funders in terms of like fund OSS and other major projects from like Ospos giving out money to open source projects, but we're starting to see federal and state money going towards open source. And it's going towards open source underneath this giant larger conversation of how do we fund dependencies? And in particular, how do we deal with security issues down the line? Over and over and over again, I'm seeing at large conferences, everyone being like, wait, my entire system is depending upon one dude from Kansas. Oh, no. Right. And maybe it's just XKCD that actually made that happen. But those conversations are much more active and they're active to the tunes of millions and millions of dollars. Whether or not those are actually going towards maintainers is a very open question. And I don't know the answer to that one. But I do know that the context and conversations has changed and the players are different. And that's something that I think is probably the most shocking to me over how fast that conversation has happened. And maybe that's just because I've sat on more calls recently with different types of people who wear suits. I don't know, but I just, I've noticed that. I think that's fair. I think that is the considerable shift that's happened since that executive order from the Biden administration, right? That seemed like a moment when all of a sudden the conversation turned from a few people talking about open source security to everyone talking about supply chain security. It was about that conversation about supply chain specifically. And I think that will have a huge impact, I hope at least, on some of this conversation about who is making money in open source right now. Because for me, I think a lot of the discrepancies that you see between projects like Vue.js or maybe Babel is that they are front and center projects. You make an active decision to use them in your stack as a software engineer, and they have a large community of people, which means that companies who are looking for returns on their investment in terms of marketing or hiring or engineer retention, see those projects and go, yeah, cool, I can get a good return on my investment for that. And security is like one of those things that you will always have to invest more in, right? It's like buying advertising in the 1930s. You're never going to over-invest in security. And I hope that that shift is positive because A, it raises the amount that companies are investing. And I think investing is the right kind of language. 
in open source and that it kind of takes some of that pressure off. It kind of gives the people who are responsible for roadmaps and maintenance of those projects a little more freedom around what is good for that project and what the future looks like for that project. And in this shifting environment, what I'm also thinking about is that it changes the skill sets that maintainers need to have. Security is something that, as we just discussed, is a hot topic right now. Are we prepared in all of the open source projects to really focus on this topic or how do we upskill everyone? There's also a question of, do we need to upskill everyone? Like, is someone with a very deep background in security and secure coding principles needed on projects all of the time? The conversation is, do we need groups of people who can get involved as an intervention? Certainly, and we see parts of that, right? Like some organization get involved with open source projects at the point that there is an issue to support them. But do we need a more general kind of approach to embedding subset of engineers in a team when that project uses some core crypto and needs a kind of greater understanding of like how to use those components for a short period of time. So they kind of go in and then leave a trail of like, okay, you need to do this, that, and the other. And then everybody else kind of comes in and learns from that point. But yeah, this is also true, not just for security, right? It might be true for people who are working in protocol design or working in like efficient, like sequential parallel algorithms, like all of these like more specialist skills and some more general skills and documentation and stuff, right? Do we need these groups of people who are able to come into a project and share what they know with those that are already involved in that project as a learning exercise and kind of bring that project up in terms of quality in that aspect at the same time? No, or maybe, or yes, it's hard to say. But really cool. It's a good question. I think this also goes back to me to Nadia Eggwell's working in public where, you know, she talks about the different types of open source projects. And I was just trying to find a random one on GitHub that I could point to being like, this doesn't need a security expert. But we all know what I mean when I say that. One of the questions I have, we are running up close to time, which is very unfortunate, but it does happen, is where are these conversations happening with chaos? What outputs can we expect in the future? And how can we get involved? As far as sustain goes, we had the report come out last year, which is like a hundred page report on how to think about open source software sustainability, which is kind of fun. That took way too much effort to release, but it was great to have it out there in public where no one can read it because it's too long. And then we also have a conference coming up at some point, hopefully in the spring. And we're really excited about that because we're always trying to hold these conversations, figure out what we can do more and better for chaos. How can I hear about what's going on? And specifically, do you have a metrics thing that talks about some projects that are valuable and some projects, well, not valuable, some projects that are stadiums and some projects that are just hobbyist projects and how to think about just ignoring half the ecosystem because they don't need your help. They're just repos that are there. Man, my wording today is really just awkward. If anyone's offended, please let me know. Podcast is the same OSS.org. Yeah, so Georg, maybe? So for... The different types of projects that there are, I always think back to report by the Mozilla Foundation, where they have created a framework of different archetypes. They've identified archetypes of open source projects. And just having those archetypes, being aware of them, you can identify from the license a project is using, how the governance is set up, how the work is being done, what kind of project it is. Is this a project that is run by a company and it's only open source by license, not by the way that they accept contributions or anything else? Or is this a project that has a lot of people involved in all kinds of stages in the project? So having those archetypes in the back of our minds is really helpful. And for chaos, with the security, that is something we have also, where we're working on metrics around security. I know that the Grimoire Lab software is right now being extended to integrate with SonarCube specifically, which is a proprietary solution that scans for code smells and vulnerabilities and whatnot to get those metrics in with the rest of the community metrics. So those are some of the things going on. And just to add to that, we do have a couple of working groups that are focused on kind of related topics. So we have a risk 
working group, which is focused on defining metrics around risk. There's also an evolution working group, which looks at where is a project in the life cycle, which is also related to that. So if you look on our metrics page, you'll find some interesting metrics under some of those working groups. Yeah, thank you, Don, for adding that. And we're running up at the end of our time. So I'm going to take the conversation. There's lots more to talk about, but put a pin in it. We can continue in other channels. And we always like to end our episodes with value ads or spotlights, where we share something that has brought value, joy, or meaning to our life recently. And I can go first. One thing that I have really enjoyed over the last couple of weeks was a local community where we are meeting in the park to do Falun Dafa, which is a Chinese meditation technique. And just the ability to find online local groups of others who are doing something cool and interesting and then meeting here in the local community and doing something together. I think that is something really amazing and it has brought some value to my life recently. Thanks. Maybe we should give spotlights to all the chaos people and value adds to all of these sustained people just to mix it up. So my value add today, to quote Tim Ferriss, what $100 thing has radically improved your life in the last two weeks? I went for a really long hike on Sunday. It was amazing. It was super fun. I did the pressure ups of Traverse in the Whites. Uh, it's just like 24 miles or something of hiking over mountains. And I bought a hydration pack, a literal camelback pouch. I feel so dumb that I didn't do this 15 freaking years ago. It was the single best thing in the world that I have ever bought and ever on all time forever. Literally, the last time I did this hike, I couldn't focus my eyes more than six feet in front of my face for three hours, which is not what you want. With this hydration pack, I'm so happy. I've never been so excited about one $35 item in my entire life. Get yourself a hydration pack if you're going hiking. Sorry, thank you. Dawn, what is your spotlight today? Yeah, so my spotlight is GraphQL. So it's basically a front end into GraphQL queries. So I Lately, I've been spending a lot of time in the GitHub API, and I have been kicking myself for not learning the GraphQL API earlier than I did. It was not as hard as I thought. And GraphQL makes it a little bit easier because you can kind of prototype some queries really quickly and see what the output looks like. And so it's made writing GraphQL queries for GitHub a way easier. So it's a definitely a value add spotlight. Makes me happy. Ben, what's yours? I'm going to cheat and do both. So I moved to the countryside 18 months ago and realized that I've got loads of nesting swifts in my roof. So I've been looking after them and we've been hosting them since May this year. They've just gone this week. And my recommendation is Swifts and Us, a book by Sarah Gibson that talks about why they're really amazing books. Amanda, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. So value add. So I think during the pandemic, a very lovely friend, Aja Hammerly, recommended this book, Burnout. And I looked at her at the time and I was like, I'm sorry, nonfiction, I'm not doing right now. I'm doing the nicest, fluffiest, or just the easiest plot lines. That's about what I can handle when I want to be able to relax. But I finally did pick up the book. So the book is Burnout, The Secret to Unlocking the Stress Cycle. It's by Emily and Amelia Nagoski. And it was fantastic, especially as we talk about sustaining and maintaining. And I highly recommend it. I especially love how the authors separate the difference between what is your stress cycle, like how your body responds to stress and being able to help your body complete what it is going through separately from what is stressing you out, what is systemic. So we talk about ecosystem, right? What is systemic, what is happening around you and how you can respond to that. So I felt like that was super helpful, especially as we think about being able to maintain ourselves, like we said, in chaotic times. And I highly encourage it for everybody. And the audiobook was a lovely listen. So if you're looking, if you like audiobooks, I recommend that too. I will go to Willem. Last week, there was exciting things happen. It's Ava to Con Asia 2022. This is the second time we hold it online and there was about 160 sessions. And we got a lot of Chinese speaker and foreign speaker. And even it's held online, but I can get to the fail week. We are doing some good things in open source world, especially spell out the RG projects in China. And the most favorite part is we had a bunch of new college students 
who just participated to the open source community and we did a round table and share their experience. And from that, I can see the great future. And I think this is very good things for the open source project sustainability. And I'm really proud. I'm a part of that because I'm the conference chair and I'm really proud of that things. I love that. Thank you, Willem. Everyone, this has been great. This has been really cool to sit and talk with a different community that's so aligned. It's so like totally adjacent and half of us are in each other's communities anyway. So, you know, who knows where the Venn diagrams meet about sustaining and maintaining and what's changed, funding all the things. Listeners, if you've enjoyed this podcast, don't worry. There are other ways that you can collaborate and get involved. So first off, you can go to Discourse, as I say, in OSS.org and join our Discourse and Conversation. You could also go to the Chaos Community Channels, which I'm sure exists in the world. Georg, where can we find those? You can find them all on the Chaos website, chaos.community slash participate. Thank you very much. You can also go to the podcast. So podcast is saying oss.org or podcast.chaos.community. It's a subdomain to the Chaos Community website. If you have any thoughts or wishes, you can always send an email to podcast is saying oss.org. They'll go to all of the podcast hosts for the St. OSS. And I'll be happy to share that along with Georg and Don and Willem and everyone else in the Chaos Community. Or you can just email them directly. You can find the links in the show notes for what their social media handles are. If you like this podcast or the Chaos Podcast, please like and subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or wherever podcasts are sold, made, refashioned, and submerged in hot boiling iron. Very exciting, and that actually does help us. So please go ahead and like those things. Furthermore, if you have other guests or ideas for podcasts, just let us know. We're really curious about it. I think I'm going to run out of subtext here, but be careful and only take these podcasts if your doctor has approved them. Again, thank you all so much, everyone. This has been really great. And yeah, looking forward to another catch-up podcast maybe uh, 18 months again. Thank you so much. <laughs>